Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for the Providence Anti-Displacement and Comprehensive Housing Strategy Preliminary Recommendations presentation. My name is Jessica Flammer. I'm a principal planner for the Department of Planning and Development. And I just want to, again, thank you all for joining us tonight as we go through the prelimi preliminary recommendations for our 10-year housing action plan. Um, I see people are still um, trickling in, so I'm going to get started with a few housekeeping things, and then we'll kick everything off. Um, Kyle, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, this meeting is being recorded. Um, the presentation will be available online in the next couple of days on the Providence um, Department website, which we'll have a link to um, later on in the slides. And we'll also send out an email blast after the meeting to make sure that everyone has a link to the slide. Participants are automatically muted and um, everyone's video is uh, disabled for the time being. And participants can be removed for inappropriate behavior. Next slide, please. We do have Spanish interpretation available for this meeting tonight. If you look at the bottom of your screen as you're logged in on Zoom, if you hover over the very bottom of your screen, you'll have an interpretation option. And everyone must select either English or Spanish. So I'm gonna give everyone a moment to locate that and click either Spanish or English. So um, if you don't have either clicked, you won't be able to hear um, the speaker. There's a Q&A window available for questions or for help throughout the presentation. If you type in your question, we'll be able to see it and we will answer all questions in the public Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, so tonight we'll, we'll go over the strategy, vision, and goals of the entire uh, plan, the key findings and key funding strategies, policy program strategies, pri and priority actions before we get into the public questions and answers. And before we jump in, I'd like to invite uh, the director of the City of Providence Department of Planning and Development, Bonnie Nickerson, to say a few words. Thank you, Jess, and good evening, everybody. Um, as Jess said, my name is Bonnie Nickerson. I'm the city planning director and head of the city's redevelopment agency. First, I really wanna thank all of you. We are getting used to this new format of meetings. So whether you're sitting outside or in your kitchen, starting to get dinner ready, um, thanks for spending part of your day with us um, to go through this tonight. So about a year ago, we set out to develop a comprehensive 10-year strategy for housing for the City of Providence. We have many plans that touch on housing needs, the comprehensive plan, the city's sustainability plan, and many others, but we don't have a single plan solely dedicated to housing. So this is our first. Our goal was to develop a blueprint for housing production that would serve as a guide for city government, so city departments, the city council, but also for nonprofit organizations, CDCs, and for-profit developers. So basically anyone in the city who's working on housing. Our goal is to have a single vision that we can all get behind and all be working toward together. So this comprehensive strategy lays out regulations and policies that we need to change, as well as new funding tools and partnership ideas. It's a guide of how to reach our goals by increasing housing production, maintaining the affordable units that we have, creating more affordable units in what we think of as high opportunity areas or neighborhoods that don't have a lot of affordable units right now. And then really looking at our existing housing stock and the existing buildings that we already have. How do we make those buildings um, more safe so that we really can provide stable housing across the spectrum of needs that we have in every single neighborhood in the city. So over the past year, you'll hear about this quite a bit, but over the past year, our team dove really deep into data. So demographic data, economic data, housing market data and analysis. 
And all of that information will be available on our website for you to use. Um, but this evening, though, we really want to spend the time reviewing our recommendations with you and getting your feedback. We kicked off this process um, by rereading all of the previous housing studies that have been done in recent years in the city and in the state. So we wanted to build on all of that knowledge and build on all of the community feedback that went into creating those plans. Uh, we also conducted our own stakeholder interviews and public meetings. Um, you'll all remember the Homes RI Summit last December, which seems like such a long time ago, but um, we got a tremendous amount of feedback through this process to understand our current needs and the, the current housing issues. Um, since the spring, the world has just changed so dramatically. Um, but the need for safe, secure, and affordable housing has never been more clear as it is really right now. Um, and that more makes what we're doing really urgent. Um, so we are very lucky to have a mayor that understands this deeply. He's been a champion of this work and he's committed to moving it forward. It's my pleasure to introduce our mayor, Jorge Lorza. Mayor. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, uh, I want to begin by also saying thank you to everybody who's taking time to join us today. We really look forward to getting your, your impact, your, your input to make sure that uh, this, uh, this report and, and this plan is as thorough and comprehensive as possible. So the reason why we jumped into this, this work, um, adding to what Bonnie just mentioned, is that we knew that even before COVID, it was getting increasingly difficult to live in the city. Uh, many people who either were tenants or were homeowners found it increasingly more difficult to, to live here. Uh, the expenses continued to, to rise. And uh, you know, I'm very proud of so many things that are happening throughout the city. Um, and in particular, I love the investments that not just the administration, but along with the city council that the city is making together to beautify our neighborhoods. And as our neighborhoods continue to improve, the last thing that we want is to price out the very people who lived here, who were born here, who have been with us through the tough times, and uh, we don't want them to be displaced and priced out during the quote unquote good times. And we want everyone to feel proud of the neighborhood that they live in and uh, make sure that these neighborhoods continue to improve while they're there and while they continue, can continue to be there. Also, you know, it's, uh, it's important to, to stop and note this moment that we're going through where there are uh, calls throughout the country uh, for social justice and a reckoning when it comes to racial issues that we simply haven't confronted for a very long time. And the truth is that throughout our history, uh, we know that housing policies have been at the center of structural inequality and racial injustice. We know that, uh, uh, we know that housing policy has determined uh, whether entire neighborhoods or entire races were excluded from some of the biggest wealth building policies in American history, namely home ownership. We also know that housing policies have determined who lives in high opportunity neighborhoods and who has a leg up on the American dream. And so with that understanding, we also believe that housing policy can be at the center of leveling the playing field and creating the just and equitable society that we all wanna be a part of. But we can't do this piecemeal. While we, have, while we may have good ideas um, and uh, there might be some good policies and important policies that we've promoted in the past, we wanna make sure that we allow ourselves the synergistic effect of bringing it all together under one comprehensive plan. And that's the idea behind this. So the administration and city council, and we committed to this, we committed to this process, and we wanna make sure that over the next 10 years, that we're on track to creating the kind of city that we all wanna be a part of, while making space for people to continue be, to be part of the city, this city, and not be, not be left out or displaced. So we wanna make sure that our 10-year plan aligns not just city halls, but also the broader community's efforts when it comes to housing. For us to create uh, the city that we all want to be a part of and to realize this vision, we're truly gonna need the entire community. And so this uh, project could not be completed and the plan could not be, um, could not be uh, uh, put forward until we got the community feedback. 
So we look forward to hearing your thoughts. We want to hear your ideas and see how we can perfect this plan and put the city on the path, the one that's committed through to housing policies that promote social justice, that promotes, promote racial equity, that uh, reduce displacement, and that uh, create the kinds of communities, as I mentioned, that we all want to be a part of. So I'll pause there, I'll hand it back to the team, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas. Thank you, Mayor Lorza, for those words. I'm a principal planner for the planning department, and the process of developing this plan amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement has really reminded me of the history of, of planning practices that have caused some of this damage to our communities of color and especially to our Black communities. Mayor touched on social equity and justice and redlining. We know that these kinds of policies kept home ownership out of reach of Black people. Our, our neighborhoods have been segregated in the city of Providence and our communities still deal with the effects of these racist and unequal policies today. We know that home ownership rates are lower, especially for our Black families, and that, um, you know, that, that caused a result of a lack of generational wealth opportunities, especially for Black residents. We know that home ownership rates are lower for Black residents, that home values are higher in predominantly white neighborhoods, and that air quality and pollution is worse in our frontline communities. We as planners are now confronted with the consequences of these decades of governmental and private policies that have segregated our neighborhoods and produced these unequal outcomes for our residents of different races. The recommendations in this plan that we're gonna lay out for all of you tonight seek to center access, equity, and justice in housing for all Providence residents, but especially for our BIPOC residents. This plan will hopefully help us to begin dismantling those decades of racist and unequal housing policy and ensure that housing in Providence is healthy, safe, and affordable, and that the benefits of development that we see in the coming decade are shared more equally throughout our neighborhoods without displacing our residents or further segregating our city. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kyle Talente of RKG Associates, the lead consultant that we've had working on this project with us through these last few months. Kyle, welcome and take it away. Well, thank you so much, Jess, and, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, to parrot a little bit of what Bonnie said, uh, this is a culmination of several months of work uh, starting with reviewing all of the previous work that has been done, not just by the city, but by partners, by the state, and trying to understand what ideas are already out there, what analysis has already been done, and then bringing all that together with a detailed empirical analysis that was done through the RKG team, engagement with the community, engagement with the city staff, to truly try and drive into a singular document, into a singular approach that um, not is, can only be championed and implemented by the city itself, but to bring all those partners together and understand how they all fit within that framework so that everyone can be pulling in the same direction. And so I think that it was very important that Bonnie started off with that comment and, it, and I reiterated to make sure everybody understands the, the context in which much of this work was done. So, Looking here at this very first slide is the, the overarching goals that were identified through this process that the subsequent recommendations we're gonna talk through in a moment uh, came from. Uh, first is provide rental and ownership housing choice opportunities for Providence residents of all incomes throughout the city. Uh, Mayor Loiza really uh, kind of hit the nail on the head and just really followed it up in terms of making sure that access, equity, and justice is something that the city drive towards over the next 10 years through its housing investments, through its policies and, and its regulations. Uh, ensuring new residential development complements Providence diverse neighborhoods. One of the wonderful things about New England cities is the, the rich history and age and, and the true exciting different neighborhoods that, that make up those communities. And so one of the things that was important through this process is to make sure that whatever recommendations came out of the back end of this 
were done so to complement what was going on and what already existed and not trying to compete or change it. And so to the best that we can, um, <clears throat> uh, the um, opportunity to uh, make sure that the recommendations are as complementary as possible. Encouraging price diversity in all new housing development is another top uh, goal here. Uh, the reality is the market drives what is developed. And so how can the city be a partner and how can the, the various nonprofits and, and housing advocates and the private sector be partners to encourage price diversity? And there's a number of recommendations that focus on expanding resources, trying to create a better connectivity between incentives and development so that it benefits not just the residents and not just the city, but it also benefits the, the folks that are making the investments to do that construction. Expanding home ownership opportunities and for Providence residents is a big one. Uh, one of the, as I mentioned, the strength of your housing stock, it's also one of the challenges in the fact that uh, a lot of your potential home ownership uh, uh, structures in the city are two family and three family and not everybody um, looks for that as, the, as what they're looking for when they want to own a home that they're also going to have rental units. And so finding ways to continue to maximize the opportunity and provide folks that want to be homeowners uh, within the city was one of the other goals that we were trying to address. And then finally, invest in Providence, Providence's historic housing stock to promote a healthy living conditions. And I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail in just a moment, but the, the, the Cliff's notes there is around saying, look, we have this aging housing stock, and you'll see in, in subsequent slides over 65% of your rental housing stock and 75% of your own housing stock was built prior to 1959. And there's a number of issues that come with that, regardless of who's living there or who owns it, uh, uh, stuff like asbestos, stuff like lead paint, uh, housing maintenance and, and condition issues are all uh, things that come to the forebear. And so that's one of the things that we wanted to make sure was identified as a goal that came out of the back end of this and something that frankly already has been being moved upon. Kyle, I'm going to jump in for one second. I noticed that we have uh, many more attendees than when we first started the meeting and I want to remind everyone about the interpretation services that we have available. If you look at the bottom of your screen, if you hover your mouse over the very bottom of your Zoom, Zoom screen, you'll have the option to pick either English or Spanish so that you can hear um, this presentation in either, either of those languages. And um, I'm gonna remind everyone too that you, you must select either English or Spanish. So if you can take a moment to pick the language that best suits you, that would be great. And I will give it back to Kyle. Thank you, Jess. So within the, we looked at it from both production goals and from uh, rehabilitation uh, goals. And from production goals on the ownership side, one of the priorities that came out of this is price diversity. And the real big takeaway there is not all areas, not all neighborhoods within the city are created equally. There are some neighborhoods where choice is very limited for those earning at or below 100% of AMI. And there's some areas of the city where choice is very limited for someone earning more than that. And so we tried to identify strategies and ways to try and promote additional diversity from the ownership uh, side uh, for residents to choose and to help um, build and grow these communities and these neighborhoods. From a type diversity perspective, we were hoping to, in, we, through our recommendations, to increase innovation, innovative ownership opportunities to complement existing neighborhoods, um, townhomes, two over twos, looking at different housing types. Uh, and that requires some refining of existing zoning policies to accommodate a greater choice citywide to kind of look at how we can create greater flexibility and to incentivize home ownership in areas where maybe home ownership rates currently are low. And once again, about that neighborhood stabilization and trying to find ways to provide existing residents in those neighborhoods to become homeowners and to build upon that, that wealth creation that Mayor Lorza was talking about earlier. Uh, cluster infill and small dot development would be preferred, whether we like it or not, Providence is a mostly built out community. And so looking at it from a one-off, two-off is probably going to be the predominant way that we're able to affect change within in housing, particularly on the ownership side. So there are a number of recommendations to find ways to create um, new higher density development, but that's also scaled to the neighborhood. And, and we'll talk about that in just a little while. And then existing rehabilitation programs are equally as important as new construction. And I, and I can't stress that enough because from the standpoint of 
as I mentioned, the vast majority of your home ownership units in the city currently are over uh, 60 years old. And so investing in making sure those houses stay high quality and, and return to their glory, if you will, is equally as important as the production of new. From a rental side, um, it's looking at increasing choice for our lowest income households outside some of the neighborhoods where the vast majority of our affordable housing exists and Broad Street Downwood, Olneyville, Hartford, uh, and some areas in the northwest parts of the city have a, a, a disproportionate concentration of those units. And so finding ways to provide greater housing choice um, is one of the production goals from the rental side. One of the other things we learned through, through the data analysis is that there isn't sufficient higher end rental development. And so that's putting somewhat what's called downward pressure on the market, meaning those uh, uh, renters are having to seek units that don't maximize their ability to pay. And as a result, puts a squeeze as you move further down the line. And so as you can imagine, you know, you start at one end and you start putting pressure on the market and the, and the folks that end up um, with the greatest challenges are the ones that have the least resources. And then continuing to maximize unit yield in downtown and the Woonsock, Pawtucket corridor, I think is gonna be critical. Those are some of the last and frankly largest developable sites. And so going vertical, which is consistent with the development in the area already, but trying to maximize how many units we get, I think is a, a, an important production goal for the city. Um, diversity, um, new construction efforts should focus on the greatest needs. One of the things we learned from the analysis was there is a substantial amount of moderate and mid, what I call mid-market um, two and three bedroom units. And there's a great shortage when you look at supply demand balance and efficiencies of one bedrooms. The market is already responding to this and the data kind of proved it. And so trying to find ways to maximize that delivery of that most unmet need through new construction is great because frankly, the, the backside of that is focus on rehabilitation efforts for the larger units. And from a housing uh, a strategy perspective, you know, one of the greatest unmet needs is for lower and, mo and, and, and extremely low income households that are requiring two, three or larger units. And so from our perspective, investing in rehabilitation of those larger units and placing them in the affordable strategy will be the most cost effective approach. And then allowing the new construction to meet those efficiency in one bedroom is a great complement to each other. It doesn't mean that it has to be all of one or all of the other. But from a prioritization perspective, we think that's the, the, the best way to go. And then, uh, and I'll talk about this a lot more later, which is around priority should be given to areas where well, that are well served by low cost transportation, access to services, access to retail and convenience and proximity to jobs. And when you look at it from a, from a map perspective, those areas oftentimes are the least affordable and that bears out in Providence. So what the big takeaway from this slide, I think, is the how important housing rehabilitation is for and how important we think it should be for the city over the next 10 years. Um, I mentioned earlier that over 65% of your rental housing stock was built prior to 1959. You can see here on the slide that there are hundreds of units that are even lacking the basic necessities, according to HUD estimates. Um, and one of the challenges we have is it's not because it's a lot of two family, three family and smaller projects, you're not getting that traditional professional management like you see in large apartment complexes in other communities. And so in those types of facilities tend to be able to self monitor and invest as they need. It's even more important in a market like this where you're having individual owners or owners who own a handful of structures rather than a large number because they tend not have the resources to be able to do it on their own. And so um, when you get anecdotal reports of illegal units and overcrowding, that, that's oftentimes a reflection of those smaller landlords trying to find a way to make it work and, and trying to address the need. And so um, rehabilitation and providing a way to do public-private partnerships to make those investments to alleviate some of those impacts, I think will be one of the uh, most uh, 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 important things that the city can do moving forward. But that doesn't mean it also shouldn't be in a home ownership. Assistance to less than deferred maintenance is important there. One of the things we learned is more than 30% of the homeowners in Providence earn less than $50,000 annually, according to the Census uh, American Community Survey. That's substantial, particularly when you're talking about such an older housing supply and the, the maintenance needed to not just uh, in, to maintain it, 
but also to provide those uh, um, uh, higher technology and more modern amenities and, and energy efficiency and so forth. And so this is not a one or the other. Uh, if the resources are limited, our recommendation would be um, rehabilitation of the rental stock because it's just such a larger component of the city. But the reality is it, it, we need to find new ways to generate additional revenues. So some of the key findings, and we've already talked through a number of these. We mentioned that there was a substantial amount of data analysis that was done. These are really the, the highlight, highlighted areas. Um, as in most communities, there's not enough price appropriate housing for households earning at 30% or below of the area median income. And that is common pretty much in every community we've ever worked in. But from a implementation perspective is, all right, how do we find ways to address that need? Because those are the most vulnerable. Those are the folks that are generally the most cost burden when you look at it from that perspective. Uh, neighborhood choice opportunities, we already talked about this a little bit, but it's worth repeating the fact that one of the things, particularly from an equity, equity and access perspective, is trying to provide greater choice throughout the city and not having to be pigeonholed in one area or the other, particularly if those areas aren't very well served with those amenities we talked about a moment ago. The age of housing and property maintenance, we, we, I mentioned the, the statistics there, the long-term disinvestment that has been identified through this analysis combined with the lack of choice for those low and moderate income households have led to some healthy home issues. And there's a wonderful study that we reviewed that, that enumerated a number of those things and, it's, and, and the data bear, bore that out. And so that's definitely one of the other areas that we looked at. Uh, another is insufficient code enforcement. And from our perspective, maybe one of the greatest challenges to having high quality, health, safe, healthy rental, particularly on the rental housing side, is the insufficient code enforcement. And the fact that we have lack required periodic inspections that many larger uh, uh, cities have done throughout the United States, frankly, has exacerbated some of those property maintenance issues. And so that is one of the things I think needs to be focused on, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And then housing type and home ownership. I mentioned this earlier. And so the fact that there's a reported market preference for single family homes, but the majority of your ownership options in the city um, uh, are two and three family structures. And as I mentioned, not everybody wants to, when they become a homeowner, also become a landlord. And so that presents some challenges. And that's particularly challenging for those households earning below 80% of AMI, where they may not have the financial resources to become a landlord, even if they want to do that. So before I turn it over uh, um, to Michelle Bush from CFAX, uh, who is our TV partner on this, I do want to say that one of the key features and the reason why this is up front in the presentation around the strategies is we recognize that currently there is not sufficient resources available to try and affect all those goals we just talked about and address all those issues that we identified. And so um, one of the things that we focused on is trying to find ways to help the city leverage the resources they have, identify new ways to make, make additional resources, but then also bring in those partners that the mayor was talking about earlier to help fund some of these strategies. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Bush. Thank you so much, Kyle, and thank you for having me tonight. I think before we get started, there's a couple of questions that maybe we should uh, try to answer. Um, one is, will the rental and homeowner assistance a uh, home ownership assistance for rehab be grants and or forgivable loans. In addition to low to moderate incomes, many of our families also endure liquid asset poverty and taking on more debt would be a deterrent to applying for such assistance. Um, is there anyone from the staff that wants to answer that question? Michelle, that's, um, we're gonna hold off on Q&A until the very end of the presentation during the public Q&A. We've got, um, we see all of your questions coming in and we are um, um, recording them. And once we get to the end of the presentation, we'll go through the list of questions that we have. Um, please continue to submit your questions through the Q&A tab um, at the bottom of your screen and we will answer everything at the end. Thanks, Thank Jess, that's perfect. So that leads into uh, my part of the presentation. I'm really excited about this because um, as Bonnie mentioned, this is not just a strategy for, uh, for the city of Providence, but it's a strategy for the entire community. And that includes your nonprofit partners, community development uh, finance institutions, 
uh, but also many corporate partners who may not have been at the table before, but there is an opportunity, an avenue to uh, bring those additional partners and resources to addressing some of the community uh, development challenges. So there's opportunities for new city revenues. There's opportunities to educate and outreach the broader community. And then most importantly, those two things should lead to leveraging uh, more strategies, uh, leveraging more resources. So the first is around new city revenues. There is a tax stab stabilization um, commitment and a de dedicated uh, millage that's going to be used to um, um, sell affordable housing bonds that are going to increase the amount of resources that are available for uh, your housing initiatives. We also are recommending that the um, government start to broaden the investment table and begin to create partnerships and what we would refer to as share value opportunities with the with the private sector and that's going to take some education uh, with the leadership in your community acting as a convener and bringing uh, partners uh, together and um, exploring new funding strategies to increase funding and then finally, drawing attention to specific underserved areas, creating new partnerships. And I'll talk a little bit further about building a neighborhood investment fund or an equity investment fund. Next slide. So the city pledged 10% uh, of its TSA revenues to a trust fund. And that generates between 1.1 and $1.4 million of resources um, every year. Uh, we're recommending that the Providence Redevelopment Authority consider leveraging that TSA commitment to have to have greater impact. The benefit of that would be more funding available to implement projects and some of those resources can be used for new construction and rehabilitation and also as a vehicle to attract private investment and public private partnerships. Uh, some of the factors that need, need to be considered is the you know, making a continued commitment of city funds to address your affordable housing needs, but also your advocacy for um, getting others to commit long term to addressing housing needs. It's really important that, um, again, as we mentioned, for the city to broaden the investment table. There's wonderful best practices all over the country where uh, corporations, banks, hospitals, foundations are stepping up and assisting government and nonprofit partners with addressing some of these long standing um, racial equity injustices and other issues that have been impacting our low income community. They all have a vested interest in improving our communities as well. And there's many examples of how corporations are partnering with the city. And we'll talk a, a little bit about those examples. But it's really important for the city to play a leadership role in bringing the public, private, and nonprofit partners together. Important to e educate them about the challenges that the community is facing, especially households of color and, and low income families. It's important to bring partners together so as a community, you can explore new ways to uh, increase funding and access to those funds. This slide is just a few examples of who could be invited to uh, join your investment table. We also recommend that you identify ways to concentrate your investments in specific areas. Uh, it's really um, uh, helpful if you've targeted an area to attract funders to that area because um, you're gonna achieve a lot more impact if you're targeting as opposed to spreading the money thinly across a number of different um, neighborhoods. And we need to bring attention to, and of course, significant investments to those historically underserved neighborhoods as has been talked about before. We would suggest, you know, maybe starting with a, with a focused partnership with a bank or a hospital 
who has a uh, similar mission around affordable housing or supportive services goals. For example, as what was mentioned earlier, there's a number of 75% of the housing stock built before um, uh, 1980, which means that many of those homes probably have lead issues. And that's certainly an issue that a hospital might want to jointly address with the city because those lead uh, impacted homes are impacting um, a, a family's um, health and those health outcomes would be important to a hospital. Banks, for example, have Community Rate Investment Act mandates and they would also be a good partner. But there are many examples, as I've mentioned, of organizations like Facebook or Verizon or many other private corporations that have expressed um, interest and commitments to uh, being a, part a partner in uh, community development activities. The last is, um, I'm sorry, Kyle, I, <laughs> if you could go back to the one just before. We also have seen examples and we would encourage you to think um, again a little deeper about these partnerships by bringing together several partners who are committed and reach a shared value proposition and um, create a larger community investment fund that could take on larger projects, take on more risk, and rapidly grow the quality and production of affordable housing units. Next slide, thank you. So a few actions that um, we would recommend, you know, again, partnering with a bank, hospital, or CDFI um, to um, accelerate the amount of money that is available for uh, funding. So combining their capacity and funding with the city's uh, resources will accelerate the production of housing. One good example is in the city of Detroit. Um, they had a, uh, home repair grant program actually and the description of that program by the new mayor when he took office in 2014 was that it was like um, hitting a, a lottery so uh, there was a concerted effort to change the uh, service delivery system for home repair program they were targeted five geographic areas uh, within the city and uh, they leveraged that money with a private bank that ended up doubling the amount of home repair resources that were available. Um, and so that has really increased the level of home repairs that could, be, that could be addressed. So the city of Providence, for example, could engage the health department or community action partnership of Providence in seeking a healthcare partner to support the growth and expansion of home repair, lead abatement, or weatherization um, efforts. Next slide, please. Um, there's also a way to bring numbers of partners together to create a, a larger um, investment strategy. And one really good example is that in the city of Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, they had the dubious distinction of being 50 out of 50 in cities in terms of economic mobility. And that was a, um, a statistic the entire city wanted to change, not just the government, but, it's, uh, but many of the private sector wanted to change that as well. They came together and the city, the foundations, private corporations, uh, a local CDFI uh, collectively developed a neighborhood investment fund valued at, at about $250 million. And it then is allowing them, of course, to uh, uh, requires less subsidy for projects. And there's a slide I'll, I'll talk about that in a second but um, also to, uh, to increase the productivity of housing, but also reach some of the lower levels of uh, income. Next slide. I think that's it for me. 
Yes, thank you, uh, Michelle, and, and uh, my apologies for the delay in uh, the slides changing when you were saying, so I, I apologize for, for ruining your flow. It's, it's easier when I'm talking because I know when to push and you tricked me a couple times, so my apologies about that. No thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. So um, there's a number of policy and program changes and new additions, uh, and when you go onto the website, and we're going to show that website when we get to the back end of this, uh, there's a larger slide deck that kind of talks in more detail about them. We frankly just don't have the time to go through every single one of them tonight. Uh, but I wanted to kind of briefly touch on these so you at least have an understanding of the concept and the intent behind the, the different approaches. And so the first slide here talks about the recommended policy changes. These are existing policies that exist uh, that, that through this process we're recommending some modifications to the things that the city are already doing. And it's not necessarily because what they're doing isn't good. It's because, you know, you always have a way to kind of tinker and find a way to build a better mousetrap. And so that's one of the things that we did. So from the policy side, you can see here, there's a number of changes to some of the existing uh, policies that the city already has. And the overarching reason we, we made these recommendations are to try and make development more cost effective through stuff like a bonus density program so that the overall per unit cost can go down, which then allows for greater affordability is to create more resources to invest in housing development and housing rehabilitation. And so find ways to create new opportunities to generate resources through the city to, to, to make these programs more viable, uh, to tie incentives to delivery. And so that's another important one. And a number of programs already do have that in place, but there are some where maybe there's an opportunity to codify a if then sort of relationship it says, if you deliver this, then this is the benefit that we're willing to provide for you. That creates greater uh, um, consistency and greater predictability. Both are things that help reduce risk and, frankly, would also drive down the cost of development. And then finally, to scale investment to outcome. Uh, and I think that's most important in terms of when you look at these programs to make sure that we are investing the right amount on a per unit basis on a um, or on a uh, uh, per development basis to make sure that what the city's getting out of it is, is the um, uh, uh, most efficient and effective use of those resources. From a zoning perspective, we're really looking at creating greater flexibility to deliver units. And so there's a number of recommendations here that focus on how do we create a, a, a paradigm where we can create greater flexibility, allow a little bit more creativity but also make sure that we're doing it and being sensitive of the existing neighborhood conditions. And I want to be very, very clear, we mentioned that earlier, is that we, we took great care in these recommendations to ensure that recommendations that came out of this were not only going to create that opportunity, but also done in a manner that is, is uh, respectful of what those existing neighborhoods look like. And then to balance the, the development with neighborhood character. And I think that's going to be another important part, which is some neighborhoods may be miszoned because of what they've already become. And so trying to match that up better so that then those areas can be allowed to continue to flourish in the manner that they've already um, um, uh, uh, kind of trans transformed into anyway. And then from a regulatory perspective, it's uh, efficiency for priority projects. And so uh, trying to make sure that if someone, if there's an investment going on that is going to meet maybe multiple goals or some very key goals or the most important goals, is to provide better efficiency in the, in the development review process so they can reduce the cost and, and, and frankly become a better partner. And then ensure that the city is getting its money's worth in terms of these investments. And like I already mentioned, a number of these programs already have those requirements, but as these new programs that are being recommended, and we'll talk about those in a moment, are being put on the table, we wanna make sure that there is clear language in there that says, if you get this benefit, then here's the, to the term of commitment that we're expecting and making sure that that is tied to a reasonable uh, uh, cost and revenue perspective. From recommended program changes, the three primary programs, the home repair program that the city has, I think one of the things here we wanted to do is, is, is increase the maximum number of households that can be served. And so there's a number of recommendations that try to get um, the program so that we can increase the number of folks that are being served. Um, obviously creating new revenues is an important component of that, but also being able to serve more with the existing revenues that we have. So becoming a little bit more efficient and leverage those dollars better. And then focus investment in priority areas. And we've talked about this already, but it's important it to, to reiterate is that 
um, and Michelle made a very good, compelling argument for that as well, which is not all areas of the city are the same. And so um, using what I like to call a rifle approach rather than a shotgun approach, I meaning focusing in on maybe those key areas where there's greatest opportunity and, and concentrating investments there oftentimes can have not only transformative results for that area, but then can become a catalyst for, for neighboring areas and start that chain, if you will, of, of improvement and allowing the existing residents to stay and, and have better living conditions. From the down payment and closing cost perspective, um, the reality is to try once again to maximize the number of households being served and to target home ownership uh, to stabilize neighborhoods and prevent displacement. And so once again, we mentioned this earlier, is around how do we, if, especially in an area where there isn't a lot of home ownership, how do we help those existing residents become homeowners and, and build on that wealth, build, uh, uh, be able to build that wealth that the mayor is talking about and also help stabilize their neighborhoods. And from leveraging strategies, and, and I'm gonna talk a, a bit more about this in a moment, is trying to create a a fair and objective analysis to um, ensure that uh, uh, we're picking projects that are going to create the greatest return from a housing goals and housing priorities that the city strategize. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. So from proposed programs and strategies, there's a number under for new production and rehabilitation. And really what we're trying to do here is, is find ways to target specific outcomes that the city's looking for. So, for example, under the universal design incentive is to ensure that new construction is done in a manner that uh, accessibility, handicap accessibility can be easier to obtain, even if it's not put in right at the development of the unit. And so trying to find ways to specifically target. Now, I will say these particular proposed programs and strategies are going to require additional financial investment. I mentioned this earlier and I, mentioned, I reiterate again why we had Michelle talk earlier in the process is we recognize that we can't continue to try and stretch the dollars that we have. We have to find new dollars to help make these programs viable. And so the prioritization of that is going to be critical. From a code compliance and a landlord tenant strategy, these are two of the priority areas we see for the city, particularly in the short term not just over the next 10 years. And I, I'm going to talk about them in more detail in just a moment. So um, I'm going to, to move into those priority actions. And so I mentioned earlier around um, the, the, the matrix, if you will, or the decision strategy to determine um, which projects we're going to invest in, which investments are going to create the greatest yield for the city. And so uh, we have identified a number of, of components for the city to consider to prioritize so that when they receive applications to get access to the city's limited financial resources, they're able to compare them all against each other in an apples to apples format that is, that is consistent and is fair for all applicants. And so that as the city's deciding where they're gonna make these investments, it's following the goals and the priorities that were established by city leadership and saying, okay, um, uh, for example, and uh, it, our priority is serving households at 50% or below of AMI. And so projects that are able to do that may score higher because they're hitting that threshold than others. And so this is a way to ensure that investments are being made that benefits the community, that benefits the residents, and focuses on those partners that are best able to deliver that. Um, from a factors perspective, because we recognize the fact that there, there's also potential downsides to recommendations, the criteria may not play to all applicant strength, causing some to restructure. And this is an unfortunate side effect as the city tries to continue to drive towards making a greater impact on housing needs, housing condition, housing development, is to, to look at it from a perspective of, well, we have to work with those entities, those partners that are going to be able to create the greatest return for our community, and then encourage those others to find ways to become more efficient, figure out ways to partner with each other, for example, and, and so that we can ensure that what we're investing in is gonna create the best benefits for the residents of the city. It also is gonna require the city leadership to clearly define what those targeted outcomes are. We're making recommendations through this process. However, it's ultimately the city's decision of what those priorities are, what those goals and which ones are the most important. And so doing that is gonna be a critical component of defining what that final decision matrix looks like. And finally, it must be reevaluated regularly. I mean, we would, might have had this conversation five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and we would have had much different um, 
ways to uh, of deciding what those priorities are. And so that's constantly going to have to be re-looked at so that those decisions are being made in a manner that does continue to reflect what the city's priorities and goals are. Um, housing rehabilitation and code compliance is the next priority action. Um, simply put, uh, both from an empirical analysis perspective and from the communication with existing renters, existing property owners, is that there is a um, disconnect and a challenge, if you will, from the standpoint of um, the quality, the safety, and the health of the units that we have in the city, particularly on the rental side. And so one of the priorities we think the city needs to be moving forward is require all rental housing units register with the city. And the reason for this is because we believe the city needs to institute a regular inspection requirements to ensure code compliance. Um, we recommended a, a nominal fee for that um, registration and that fee would be go directly towards the code compliance program. And so it would be to hire the, the compliance officers to be able to do the inspection. And frankly, also, we, we did it in a manner that could then create some resources available to help invest back in those properties that are identified that need rehabilitation to bring them up to code. And so once again, it's, it's trying to balance the need of the residents, the need of the city in terms of wanting to maintain its existing housing stock, but also the need of the property owners. And so trying to maintain that code compliance and maintain that uh, rehabilitation um, may have an initial short-term impact as some of those units are, are brought back to, a, to, to code, but long-term will have benefits for those owners as they are able to maintain and, and, and frankly uh, invest less over time because those properties are, are going to constantly be in good condition. Some of the challenges though, and we recognize this, um, is that we recognize that that cost may create some resistance. And once again, I go back to, we know that it, with every good recommendation, there's a, there's a, a, a reasonable and, and a, a rebuttal. However, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll reiterate again, housing rehabilitation, particularly on your rental stock, is frankly one of the most important issues for the city, not just, not just from a health and, and safety perspective, but also from a long term of preserving the unique characteristics and frankly the, 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 the um, neighborhoods that define what, a, what Providence is, what a New England city is, and that's something that's worth protecting. Um, and unfortunately, um, we've done this work throughout the United States, both uh, uh, Corporate Facts and Michelle and, and RKG and myself, and there's really no other way to effectively address citywide housing stock needs than through a program like this. And then finally is landlord-tenant relations. And, and once again, I wanna reiterate and stress the fact that we're trying to focus on the balance. And so on one hand, um, expanding the city supports for tenant rights is a critical component uh, to making sure that tenants are being treated fairly. Um, however, it also needs to be done in partnership with working with landlords not only to build buy-in to the programs and strategies and refine them so that they're done in a logical and a reasonable way that's not going to create an undue burden, but it also provide, can help provide resources that bridge the gaps between landlords and tenants. And one of the things, particularly of not having a code compliant um, uh, requirement within the city is right now, residents are the first line of identification of those compliance issues through uh, the 311 program or through reporting them to the city. And that can create tension and challenges between the tenant and the landlord. And so trying to find ways to bridge that gap, trying to find ways to make it more fair and evenly applied, trying to find ways that's going to ensure we can provide safe and healthy housing in the city is a critical component. Um, uh, from a factor perspective, obviously um, it requires constant engagement and monitoring of available programs, even those not funded by the city. And I think that's an important component to consider because uh, there are a number of, of programs available within the city uh, that aren't run by the city itself. Uh, however, there's all, a lot of good relationships already established with a number of those entities. And so um, there's a way through additional investment on the city side to make sure that those relationships can continue to be built. And so that there is a real time in interaction between the programs and the policies that are being made and the property owner perspective. I think that one of the other critical components of this particular recommendation is, um, and, and it kind of bleeds back into a little bit about our discussion about existing programs, is to provide uh, rehabilitation or investment programs that are also available to landlords. 
Uh, and I think that's going to be a critical component. That's the carrot side of the, the code compliance requirement is recognizing the fact that um, providing resources to help those landlords, particularly those smaller landlords that may not have the, 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 the uh, resources to be able to do it on a larger scale, or if particularly if there's a severely impacted uh, um, structure, is to bring some resources to bear and help them as well, not just homeowners, but also the landlords so you can help balance that. And, and so those are from the RFAG team's perspective, those are the three priority areas coming out of the gate where we would encourage the city to try and focus its efforts. Obviously the funding component is the fourth one and we talked about it earlier. And a lot of these programs and policies that are enumerated in this document, particularly the newer programs will require a greater resource uh, identification. Because as I said, and I'll go back to, and I'll finish with this thought before we turn it over to the questions and answers, is the fact that the existing resources that are available to the city now are not sufficient to be able to address all these programs, all these needs, all these goals, all these priorities. And so finding those additional resources, maybe, maybe I should have led with that, and my apologies, is that, that resource development, that resource leveraging and bringing those partners to the table uh, is, is probably the most important thing so that all these other programs that can address the other goals and priorities identified through this analysis can come to fruition. Because if, if we try and do all this stuff with the existing resources, we, we just won't be able to affect change very well in any one of those particular areas. So with that, from, from a presentation perspective, I want to thank you all for participating tonight to, and for asking your questions, which I'm looking forward to being able to answer. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jess, and we are going to try and get through as many questions as we can with the rest of the time that we have. Thank you, Kyle. As Kyle said, we're going to turn it over to the public question and answer section at this time, and we have about half an hour to do that. We see that we've been getting questions through the Q&A box um, throughout the presentation, and we encourage you to keep those coming. We'll do our best to get through as many of them as possible. Um, any questions that are in the Q&A box that are not answered during the live meeting, we will record and we'll answer them and have a Q&A um, PDF on the uh, Providence website. Kyle, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so as I said, we'll have the recording, the meeting recording and the Q&A all available on the city's website, um, which is listed right there on the slide in front of you. You can also, we'll also have public comment open for about 10 days after the meeting, it, the meeting recording is posted to the website. And I will be taking questions and comments via my email address, which is also here on the slide. We'll keep this slide open while we go through the Q&A so that you have an opportunity to jot down my email address and that URL. I will be sending out a, an email blast once the meeting recording is posted to the website with this information available. So um, if you're on our email list, you'll get that reminder once it's ready. If you are not already on that email list, you can either email me directly or you can go to the Comprehensive Housing Strategy website and um, sign up on our email blast list. With that, I will turn it over to Martina Haggerty, the Director of Special Projects and we will start with the Q&A. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us. Um, and as just said, we've had a lot of Q&A streaming in via the question and answer feature here on Zoom. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to submit your question yet, there's still plenty of time. So please feel free to keep adding those in there. As Jessica said, if we do not get to your question this evening, we will be posting um, all of the Q&A received uh, to the project website, which is up on the screen right now. For folks who uh, cannot see the screen if you're calling in by phone, that project website is www.providenceri.gov forward slash planning forward slash comprehensive dash housing dash strategy. And if you didn't get all that, you can also reach out to Jessica directly her email address is jpflaumer at providenceri.gov. 
All right, so we're going to take a few questions here and um, I'll hand them off to the most appropriate team member to, to answer them. Uh, Kyle, if we could leave that slide up with uh, Jessica's contact information in the project website, uh, I think that would be handy. Thanks. All right, so uh, we have a question about um, the, the timing of this and uh, I'm going to kick that over to our director of planning, Bonnie Nickerson. Uh, so the question was, um, if this is a plan project or if it's already in full effect and how long before uh, the recommendations of this plan actually exist. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, so as we said at the beginning, this process actually kicked off about a year ago. So we started last August and when we brought Kyle and his team on board. So we've been underway with this plan for, for the past 12 months or so. Um, at the end of September is when we hope to actually um, issue the plan itself or early October. So um, this, this presentation is really meant to say, here's where we're headed. These are our preliminary recommendations. What feedback do you guys have? Incorporate that into the document, which will be the actual plan itself. And that plan will be launched either the end of September or early October. Um, and then as you, as you can see through all of the stuff that Kyle walked through tonight, there are a series of things that we're, recommend, that we're recommending. So how long before it actually exists, each of those will be kind of on its own time frame. Some of the funding mechanisms we're hoping to be able to launch very soon. Some of the regulatory changes, um, zoning and the inspections and things like that, we can also launch very soon. A lot of these do not actually have a dollar figure attached. Some of those policy recommendations are just policies that we need to work through with our partners on the city council and actually just move forward with. So there's a lot that we can move forward with. Um, and so, and then the second part of the question, um, as I said, we've been working on this for a year and this meeting's been scheduled for some time. So doesn't, doesn't coordinate with any of the other um, announcements that were made today, so, so is not related to that. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, we had another question about some of the data that was used in making these recommendations uh, and if that data will be available. Uh, it is available, it's a great question. It's available on the project website, which again is on the screen here. Uh, if you click on that link, uh, you'll not only be able to see this shortened version of the presentation uh, that you just saw, uh, you'll also be able to download a longer version that does have a lot of the data that backs up some of these recommendations included in it. Uh, and well, that's also where the recording of this session will be posted once it is available. All right, uh, we have another question about rental and home ownership assistance. Um, I'm going to probably kick this one over to a combination of Bonnie and Kyle. Uh, and the question is, will the rental and home ownership assistance for rehabilitation be grants and or forgivable loans? Um, many of our families endure liquid asset poverty and taking on more debt would be a de deterrent to applying for such assistance. Bonnie or Kyle, do you want to take that? Um, yeah, sure. I think um, I also might ask Emily Friedman to jump in since she actually runs um, some of these programs that we have right now. And we've talked quite a bit about um, how to adjust these programs to make them more widely available. So Emily, do you want to speak to that? Sure, absolutely. Good evening, everyone. Emily Friedman. I'm the city's director of community development. And as Bonnie mentioned, we do have an existing housing rehab program for owner occupants. Um, and one of the recommendations that's come out of this um, study is looking at the terms at which we provide that assistance. Um, you know, obviously when you're offering grants or forgivable loans, that's money that is able to be spent and lent out only once. It doesn't revolve. And so one of the recommendations under this study was to potentially develop tiered assistance. So really looking at the level of need and providing a suite of products that are tailored and potentially in some cases for families that can afford it, um, carry an interest rate, which by offering an interest rate, um, it could potentially be relent multiple times and attract outside investment. 
Um, and Kyle or Michelle, feel free to jump in if I didn't summarize that 100%. No, you did a great job, Emily, but uh, just to build upon that is um, one of the recommendations that is coming out of this is not necessarily for all the resources that are used towards rehabilitation, but uh, is to look at ways to try and recapture some of that money over time. So whether, you know, whether it's something that's payback when the, the property is sold or refinanced or whether it's something that has a time limit where it has to be refinanced back in. Um, it, we have encouraged a number of options to the city uh, to look at ways that, that that dollar can be, if you will, can be respent on additional loans and, and uh, or additional uh, rehabilitation projects. Michelle, do you have anything to add? I would just say that in other cities where these uh, leverage loan funds uh, have been implemented, uh, what has been a surprising I think benefit is that the loans have spread across all income levels. They have not left out the very low income and they've gone all the way up in the, in the areas where it's allowable up to 120%. Are we saying every dollar has to be a loan? No, but I do think there's an opportunity to leverage a portion of those, of the um, city's investment and there are lots of uh, examples where um, uh, families of all income levels can benefit from even a loan program. All right, thanks so much, Michelle. All right, uh, we're gonna move on to our next question here. Um, are you willing to allow multifamily properties to convert uh, two or three bedroom units to two separate one bedroom units, for example. Um, I, I suppose I'll, I'll kick that over to, to Bonnie. Feel free to um, kick it back to another team member if you'd like. Sure, so this, it, so I think the short answer is yes. It just depends on which zone that you live in. So if you live in a R3 um, zone, you're already allowed to have three units. If you live in an R4 zone, you're allowed to have um, more units. If you live in a C zone, then you're allowed to have as many residential units as your property can have. Um, so it, it really does depend on where you live. But um, some of the zoning recommendations that we're, that we're thinking about are really how do we create more units. And so the idea of adding an ability to, for example, create an accessory dwelling unit and things like that is really getting to, I think what the kind of the essence of the question is, is how do we allow for additional units within the same um, building fabric that we have? And so it's absolutely one of the goals of the plan. How do you do that in a way that kind of works with the neighborhood character that we have? And um, so yeah, I think absolutely it's it's something that we want to allow for. Thank you, Bonnie. All right, our next question uh, is actually an excellent suggestion um, for the city to provide a glossary for some of the, the terminology that we're using. And thank you for that reminder. Uh, that is something that we uh, are planning to do for the, the report itself that will be issued, uh, but that's an excellent reminder. Uh, to be more inclusive with our language. So thank you for that. Um, there's a specific term that this, this particular person had asked us to define, uh, ad valorem uh, millage, and perhaps Michelle or Kyle could answer that one if they're willing to. Uh, I'd be happy to. Um, just to, in the, when you go to the website, there's this slide deck, which is the presentation, and then there's a larger slide deck that does have a glossary of some of the terminology. I, I don't know if it has ad valorem in it or not. Uh, my apologies for not remembering off the top of my head, but effectively, um, ad valorem is the tax on real property. So the tax on a piece of land or a, a building in a piece of land. Thank you, Kyle. All right, our, our next question I think is perhaps, no, it's a, it's a different question than we had before. Uh, this is, um, why don't you convert more multifamily buildings into condos so that lower income residents can own their apartments? Um, I can take that one. Oh, sure, Bonnie. Um, 
so that is allowed. It's not something that the city does. We don't actually convert um, units from rental units into home ownership units, but that's absolutely allowed. If you have a multifamily building that is um, currently all rental units, you can, as the, as the owner or developer of that building, you can convert that into condominiums. And there's a, a legal process to do that, but that is currently allowed. So what we regulate is the number of dwelling units, but not whether that dwelling unit is um, either an apartment or a condo. Thank you, Bonnie. Okay, uh, our next question, I'm gonna ask Kyle uh, from RKG Associates to answer. The question is, other than supply side solutions, such as building more, what regulatory strategies were included in the plan besides increasing code enforcement? Uh, in particular, uh, what, what about controlling rent fluctuations based on speculation, such as rent control and other policies to disincentivize real estate speculation? Um, well, to, to speak specifically to the concept of rent control, the experience that we have had in other communities that we've worked in that have used that process is unfortunately over time, it gets um, distorted, if you will, in terms of because the rent control stays with the unit and not with the tenant. And so from that perspective is, uh, and, and New York City is a perfect example of where they have situations where a, a, an individual who has means will pay someone who's in a rent control unit to get on the lease and then live with them. And then when the other person moves out, they stay there within the rent control. And so it can, it can be a challenging thing to do. The other side of it also is been proven to create disincentives for um, modernization, rehabilitation, and it creates uh, just, uh, um, um, deferred maintenance, meaning the owner of the property is not as willing to invest in it because they're not going to be able to get the revenue out of it to be able to justify those costs. And so the other solutions that we provide, we think are much more effective at addressing the same need without having to go down that road. So for example, the, the rehabilitation program for uh, rental units is one of the recommendations where you can provide resources to help property owners of rental units to make those improvements. And because you're deferring the cost to them, then it doesn't require them to have to charge uh, uh, a substantial increase in their rent. And so as a result, you're able to help hold down the cost of housing because the cost to the owner isn't as great. Uh, other recommendations, there's a local housing voucher recommendation there that if resources ever become available, that the city can implement its own um, um, uh, uh, individual base, not, not uh, a voucher tied to a particular unit, but tied to a household that they can use to then go um, acquire uh, price appropriate housing and use that voucher to be able to, to gap the distance between market and, and what they're able to pay. Uh, there are other recommendations in, in there that focus on this, but to address the question directly, we, we recommended different strategies to get at the same thing that then doesn't tie the hands of the property owner to be able to maintain a health and safe unit and do so ensuring that they're serving the folks that that policy is intended to serve. Thank you, Kyle. And if you wanna stay um, unmuted there, I'm gonna direct this next question to you as well. Um, well this question is when the city invests uh, public or private or charitable funds into housing, how will we ensure that the housing's residents, not a real estate investor or corporation or out of city or out of state landlord are generating wealth from that property. How can we invest in community land trusts and resident cooperatives in the city to ensure not only wealth generation and foreclosure and market resistance, but also local control of our land and housing? Kyle, could you take that one? Sure, uh, there's a recommendation in there in terms of, of a uh, housing acquisition fund which could easily be dovetailed in partnership with a housing uh, a land trust or a housing trust concept. And so uh, we feel the recommendation that we did make around trying to create resources for acquisition that could be either held by the city, held through the, the PRA or, or the, excuse me, the, the Providence <laughs> uh, uh, Redevelopment Authority or through a, a partner. We, we've worked in many of other communities where they bring on um, 
third party nonprofit or even the local housing authority as a partner um, to be able to enter into those long term land trust strategies that they can maybe hold on to the land and maintain that with an ownership within a trust and then have the structures owned by the individual so that they're able to keep the overall cost of those units down and then enter into agreements with the folks that either rent or buy there so that those units stay quote unquote affordable uh, in perpetuity uh, in exchange for not having to acquire the land. So we think that the recommendations that we have in there are, are consistent with strategies like that. And if that's the direction the city wants to go, I think the, the foundations are able to do that are already laid in, in the document that's being created. Thank you, Kyle. All right, our next question uh, is from Vanessa. Um, she wants to know who she can reach out to about partnering with the city. Um, why don't you start with Jessica Flaumer, our principal planner, uh, who was speaking earlier. Her contact information is on the screen here. Again, that's Jessica Flaumer, and her email address is up on the screen. Jess, maybe you could um, provide your office direct line as well, if you don't mind, for, for folks that would prefer to call you. Sure. So my office phone number is 401-680-8500. And I will make a note that I'm working remotely right now and I'm checking my voicemail um, occasionally. So if I don't get back to you as quickly as I normally would when I'm working in the office, rest assured that I will get back to you. Um, the easiest way to contact me is through email right now. But again, my office phone number is 401-680-8519. Thank you, Jess. All right, uh, our, our next question um, is in regards to homelessness. Uh, and I'm gonna have Emily Friedman, our community development director answer this. Uh, the question is, I am wondering how this plan has incorporated the needs of folks experiencing homelessness. Can anybody speak to how the city has conceptualized addressing this incredibly important issue and extending the anti-displacement policies to include those who are housing insecure or experiencing homelessness. Emily, would you mind answering that? Absolutely, and that's an excellent question. Um, as we talked about earlier in the presentation, um, we engaged a number of partners and uh, housing providers through this process, um, and that included a number of Providence's homeless service providers. Um, and so certainly their feedback was taken to, into account during this uh, development of this plan. And additionally, uh, one of the key findings that was mentioned earlier is that we have a shortage at the lower end of the cost spectrum. And that produces such a challenge for our many providers who are working really diligently with our populations that are experiencing homelessness to try to place them. Uh, ultimately, the goal of our homeless system is to help people transition into permanent housing, um, and particularly permanent housing that's coupled with supportive services. And having a shortage of units that are affordable to the, those earning at or below 30% of area median income creates such a challenge for our providers. And so that's one of the critical production goals you're going to see in this plan over the next 10 years is boosting that supply so that as we are making resources available for rental assistance, for supportive services, that there's a place, a safe, habitable place to, uh, for people to, to rent and to be available to them. Thank you, Emily. Okay, um, we have got a question here uh, in regard to student housing, and I'm going to ask Kyle to perhaps start with this one. Um, what is the recommendation about student housing? So the recommendation, and, and, and Bonnie actually or, or kind of already somewhat answered this question earlier uh, around the can you convert some units and large units, is the recommendation is to identify um, areas where promoting student housing is appropriate uh, and done so in a manner that is consistent with the character of the existing neighborhood. And so the, the, the student housing recommendation focuses in on trying to ensure that as uh, 
investment or development or redevelopment or rehabilitation is, is occurring it's, and, it, and it's being done in an area that makes the most sense for housing that's targeted towards students, that is, is allowed. So for example, um, one of the things we, we recommended the, the, the removal of the lot minimums in R4 zoning. Uh, so you can be able to put more units that can then be done uh, in a manner that is consistent with creating a, a housing for uh, student housing. Mm -hmm. And so it's really around being sensitive to where it is located because the reality is as the, as the colleges and universities in Providence continue to thrive and frankly will grow over time, the need for additional housing is going to be um, not just consistent but probably increase. And so trying to ignore it is only going to exacerbate the challenges, particularly for your most vulnerable households where the students um, will then become price competitive with them to try and go after the units that they have. Thank you, Kyle. All right, um, we've got a, a question that um, is actually uh, a great follow up to the question that you just answered, Kyle. Uh, this question is, uh, what role can colleges and universities play in addressing housing needs? So I think you, you may have partially started to answer that, but maybe you could follow up there. Absolutely, and I'm gonna kick it to Michelle in just a moment, but um, my response to that would be, uh, continue to engage and partner with them in understanding what their housing needs are and what their strategies around housing is and how can the city become a partner to help them, whether it's modernizing their existing dormitories or trying to find ways to make it more regulatory uh, feasible for them to make those investments. Um, but I think probably the greatest opportunity, and this is why I'm gonna kick it to Michelle, is through one of those uh, investment funds or one of those um, uh, partnership arrangements where it's something that can be done in tandem and not necessarily just with the university, but could also be done with the private sector as well. But Michelle is going to explain it much more eloquently and, and, and uh, comprehensively than I will. Absolutely. So um, universities are, you know, what we refer to as anchor institutions has played a critically vital role not only in the last couple of years when we've seen hospitals come to the table, but they've been a major community investment partner, I would say, over the last 10 years. And they've done a variety of things to um, invest in community, ranging from, you know, investing in physical assets um, on and around their campus. They've uh, done things like procurement strategies to create business opportunities for uh, small businesses, especially uh, minority uh, businesses. And they also, you know, have a need to provide housing, not only for their students, but for their workers. So they have a vested interest in uh, community development. Uh, and I would suggest that they would be one of the primary partners that you would want to bring to the table. Great, thank you so much. I would just, I would just add one thing that, um, that colleges and universities um, can, should, and are building more student housing on their campuses. So we're seeing that quite a bit um, right now. And so that does um, you know, reduce that pressure on the surrounding neighborhoods for them to just build more housing on their campuses. And we are seeing that. I think what we're also seeing, though, is that it's not as closed. So we used to see campuses with fences around or, you know, parking garage on the street front. And so what you're seeing more is um, anchor institutions like university wanting to open up to be more a part of the community and providing that student housing either directly on the campus or, or around the campus is, is some of the strategies that they're pursuing. Great, thank you, Michelle. All right, so let's see. Um, again, just to reiterate for folks, um, I, I'm not sure if we'll be able to make it through all of the questions we've received thus far, but if you haven't had a chance to ask your question yet, feel free to add it to the Q&A. We'll see if we can get to it. Um, if not, you can email it to Jessica, whose, whose contact information is up there on the screen. We'll also be providing answers to all of the questions, those we answered live and those that we didn't have time to answer uh, on the project website, which again is, is up on the screen right now. So we encourage you to check back there um, in about a week or so and hopefully we'll have better answers for you for some of those questions that we didn't get to. Um, all right, so let's take a few more questions. Um, 
A question here. Um, will preference or incentives be available to developers that propose projects that address the needs Kyle discussed, such as the need for affordable home ownership and the creation of income based rental housing specifically for rental units over one bedroom. Um, she says, I'm specifically thinking of the Citizens Bank parcel redevelopment that proposed mostly one bedroom units. Uh, Kyle, would you be interested in taking that? And maybe Bonnie, you could chime in if you'd like to. Theoretically, from our recommendation, that's through that kind of merit-based uh, allocation of the city's resources, looking at that decision matrix and saying, what are the priorities that we're trying to address with this particular resource or this particular program? What are, where are the areas that we want to have the greatest impact with that program? And then use that to make determinations of which programs are going to create the greatest return or value, if you will, to the city and its residents. And so theoretically, from our perspective, yes, what we're hoping the city moves towards is trying to, as you have multiple applicants coming in for the same resources, is to be able to say, these ones rank one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, to the end, we only have enough resources to do six of them, and so these are the ones that we're going to invest in. I would also just add that, like in the Charlotte model, the what they have uh, developed is opportunities for uh, private developers, market rate developers to access low cost capital um, that acts as an, an incentive uh, to provide affordable units in market rate development. And we're particularly interested in that because we want um, lower income households or households of color to have opportunities to live in non low mod income areas and providing those incentives to developers is one way to do that. Thank you, Michelle. All right, uh, our next question uh, is uh, any thoughts regarding strategies for seniors with home repair issues, but who want to age in place. That's a great question. And I think I'll ask Emily Friedman uh, from our community development team to answer that if she can. Sure, so that did come up as a recommendation that we have a population um, that is growing older over the next 10 years. And we also have a housing stock that's predominantly two and three families that doesn't lend itself well to people living and aging in place. And so that did come up as a recommendation for expanded housing rehab resources um, to provide modifications that might be needed to provide low barrier assistance to help seniors make the improvements they need that would help them age in place. Thank you, Emily. Uh, would anybody from the consultant team like to add anything to that? Uh, just to say is that um, we, and we did recognize and we do think that um, creating priority or creating an earmark for particularly the, the um, the aging population, the senior population, to allow them to age in place or at least give them that option, I think is a critical is a critical strategy. I think also um, the the universal uh, design incentive for new construction or for major rehabilitation, where even if you're not putting in those accessibility features at the time of construction, for example, you're putting the blocking into the walls, and so that if it ever needs to be converted or you're creating one restroom with a four foot wide door, for example, you're creating the opportunity for folks as they, as they, if they want to age in place, there's gonna be opportunities and choice within the city to do that. Thank you, Kyle. All right, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions, depending how detailed they are. Um, so let's see, um, here we go. How will sustainability aspects of housing be incorporated into the process? For example, renewable energy, open space versus density and cooperative housing. Um, I think uh, maybe, uh, I'm not sure who from the project team would like to answer that, you know, maybe a combination of Bonnie, Kyle and Michelle, I'll let you guys decide. Um, it, it's a great question and I think um, folks are aware that the city has a sustainability plan that has a lot of detailed recommendations. So it is an opportunity to make sure that the housing plan is synced with our sustainability plan. 
Um, and there are a lot of ideas in there that, that we would like to move forward. So open space versus density, um, that's always going to be um, a challenge to strike that right balance. Um, but, you know, I think we talked a little bit about the, um, the idea of cooperative housing models and land trusts are um, innovative recommendations. And I, I'm absolutely open to that and want to see what our regulatory framework, um, how, how that can be changed if that is a barrier to those sorts of things. In general, when it comes to the, the question of density, um, we really are just allowing more density to sort of freely um, be developed as a way to increase the supply of units kind of at all levels to, to provide more housing overall. But in general, the goal is to sync our housing plan with our sustainability plan and make sure that they align. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, so it looks like we are at about 7.30 and um, thank you all so much for your time tonight. We do wanna be respectful of your time. Uh, we appreciate you joining us this evening, taking time out of your schedules to tune in here and provide feedback. Uh, if we did not get to your question, uh, do not worry, we will provide an answer. It'll be available on the project website once we've had a chance to go through any questions we didn't get to and uh, we'll provide all of those answers in writing as well as this live recording. Uh, right now, the presentation itself is available on the website but the live recording will follow soon as well as the full Q&A. Um, we also have that longer presentation that has uh, some of the data that backs up these recommendations and dives in in a bit greater detail to these recommendations since we weren't, weren't able to get into all the detail that we wanted to in the, this presentation this evening. But on behalf of the entire City of Providence uh, Department of Planning and Development, uh, our partners in other city departments and over at the City Council, as well as the consultant team, I just wanted to uh, say thank you again uh, we appreciate your input. We look forward to your continued input here. This is very much a draft proposal right now. So please uh, provide that feedback. Uh, you can send your feedback directly to Jessica Flaumer, whose contact information is here on the screen. Uh, her email address is jpflaumer at providenceri.gov. And we look forward to hearing from you. Have a great night.